Well, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for today's Connect uh, Head session on delivering multi-cloud apps with Cisco Connected Experiences. My name is Pete Robertson. I am a network and Cisco specialist here at AHEAD, and uh, I enjoy helping our customers architect multi-cloud secure network solutions to enable them for their digital transformation journeys. Uh, joining me today is my colleague and good friend, Johnny Hatch. Hey, everyone. My name is Johnny Hatch. I am the director for our enterprise monitoring and analytics practice living in Minneapolis. Thank you, Johnny. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, we will be keeping microphones muted for today's session. So at the end, we will be facilitating a Q&A session. Uh, we invite you to submit any questions throughout today's presentation using the Q&A panel of the WebEx events app that you are in. And uh, we look forward to today's discussion, so thank you for joining us. For the, uh, for the past couple of weeks, uh, we at AHEAD, as well as the, the public and our customers, have had the, the privilege of uh, participating in Cisco Live, Cisco's annual conference, and uh, having the opportunity to hear from Cisco CEO Chuck Robbins and others in the Cisco leadership team around how Cisco continues to evolve into being more of an application and software-centric a solution provider that's bringing great innovation to the market to help bring secure enterprise multi-cloud strategies to reality. And uh, this past week, we at AHEAD have also enjoyed multiple discussions with uh, Cisco's product engineering teams to learn more about some of their recent announcements. And, uh, and I can really say that I'm, I've never been more confident in the ability for AHEAD's engineering and consulting practices along with Cisco's solutions to, to combine to deliver on the vision of digital transformation and to provide our customers uh, enhanced capabilities to, to onboard DevOps, multi-cloud, and intelligent operations. Uh, it's my privilege today to welcome Carl, Carlos Pereira from Cisco. He is the uh, chief architect of Cisco's global specialist organization, and he is going to share with us how Cisco's connected experience approach helps deliver multi-cloud applications. Thank you for joining us, Carlos. Welcome. So thank you, Pete. Thank you, everybody. Thanks ahead more than anything for all the partnership throughout the years and for the business that we do together and how it can be helping customers on, on many fronts. So um, on a personal level, thanks for having me here on the event. It's, it's an honor. So as, as Pete said, my name is Carlos. I'm the chief architect for the Global Specialties. I've been in Cisco since to, to have hair back then. It tells that there is a lot of water under the bridge. And, and yes, Cisco Live happened last week, and I, I had two sessions that I presented on the topic of connected experience. I, I would love if you have time later to check it out. They are available for on-demand library for recording. The one on the first day, we cover a demo of end-to-end -end that put everything working together. By everything, I talk about SD1, cloud security, yeah, compute, storage, multi-cloud connectivity, and all the piece that relates with the collaboration experiences and programmability DevOps on a, sh on a demonstration that takes about 20 minutes. And on the second day, I had a, a, a session that covers how connected experience applies to the use case on the post-COVID new normal from secure remote access all the way to application experience and, and management which is the topic of that particular session here. So we're going to talk about delivering apps with Cisco Connected Experience. So I'm going to briefly talk about, on a very brief note, what we mean by Connected Experience. So we introduce Connected Experiences as a concept of trying to easy uh, the consumption of technology for any customers by being predicated on three easy dimensions, the dimension of Connect, dimension of secure, and the dimension of ultimate. So whatever you're, you're working from now, either at home or, or some, some states are already out of lockout, some are still in, some countries are already sort of back to normal. So you need people to connect, and that connection needs to be secure, either for, for home or for offices, workplace, workforce allowed, and, and that security applies to connectivity to consumption applications, and then you automate that experience. So the scope that we introduced as a dimensions was the three that I mentioned before. So from a connect standpoint, the users and devices need to connect to application and data. That can be local, that can be in your office, in the data center, and obviously in public cloud and SaaS as providers of applications and, and services. 
Secure applies to the triangle of workforce, workloads, and workplaces, which obviously serves on top of the connectivity as a premises on the first dimension, if you will. And after you construct those two, then what you want to do is automate not only your IT process as it relates to operations and your business process as well. So we put this together. We explored this in more details at Cisco Live. And what I'm going to do here on, by invite of a head is to go on what does that mean when we talk about multi-cloud, multi-cloud applications from the lens of this connected experience. So in order to go there, and as being a techie by heart, and my role inside Cisco is, is an interesting because I have the role of being the, the global specialist. So I deal with all the technology spaces and, and pretty much what and how they come together for customers to consume and also for our developers to develop something that is relevant for them. So with that charter in mind, which is a lot of our customers, CIOs and head of IT operations mainly do have similar charter. So what was obvious to me on the last two years and a half or so, uh, being in that role and, and working more on the almost training that I had before, is a product is not going to make the cut. It, this is not a product conversation. So we have multiple products, offers, and more than anything, partnerships. And what we took as an approach for the multi-cloud execution, not for the PowerPoint, for the execution, what you need to do, it was pretty much those three pillars. The outside in focus, so not necessarily for many of the use cases that relates to managing the application experience for either a user that's using a mobile app or it can be an experience for, let's say, a financial organization that has a multi or omni-channel kind of experience for their customers to consume financial services, which are now facing the experience as it relates to healthcare for, because of the pandemic going on. But the whole point is how you have an outside in focus. And then there is a persona-driven approach. Every organization, if it's an organization that has been traditionally built for many years, it usually have their multiple teams and you have a typical application team and you have IT ops teams, the operations of IT, we have people dealing with networking and compute and storage and OSs and so on and so forth. And they're typically the security team, which are the CISOs and the SecOps folks. So this persona driven perspective, we start to think about it and put together a motion that if you are a traditional organization, we pretty much come from this motion. The systems and the business runs on applications that would build and construct on operations based on that. There's a lot of IT that comes with that and some of the services, operations that relate to IT best practices, which are all great. And there is no dream of making a single data lake and a single God tool that will bridge all the charters and all the charges of everybody. And what we did is how we approach the persona charges and the team charters while making them operating efficiently together. However, if you are a company that was born on the cloud, so you never had that, then you start from a DevOps standpoint. The concept of teams and personas don't apply very quickly, and they not necessarily even apply at all. So some people, some companies that are born in the cloud, they start from the DevOps, they have a single app or a subset of a dimensional platform that has services on top of that app that they offer, and, and everything for them is a single team, and the functions are automated, and they are part of the DevOps pipeline. So the reality that I'm seeing is that the majority of the customers that we talk with they do have still a motion of, of IT and a motion of multiple teams that are in charge of the business and applications that run this business. And they do have teams that are doing DevOps for the digital transformation, acceleration for the digital applications, which is now much more prevalent and prioritized given the COVID and post-COVID norm. And the last pillar was operation center. So everything we are doing is now focused on the life cycle. If you deliver and someone deploy a product, so Cisco deliver a product, their head goes and deploy a product of Cisco, and, and it's not going to stand there only. There is a whole life cycle of operations and how 
that works and how that needs to be changed and improved and augmented on the process of making the business of our heads customers to work best. So with those three minds, and I'm spending time on this a little bit because then the rest will become an easy flow on how we made that reality. So, so from an operations, from an outside in perspective, what it did is instead of going to the IT folks and ask them, hey, what do you think is a priority? We did a survey one year ago when we went to the market, we commissioned IDC to do that survey for us, and we asked the, the, the bosses of the IT guys. So you said, if you are the CIO, who's your boss? Is the CEO or if you're IT director, what the, the answers that we are looking for were through the question that is on the top. What is from a leadership team expectation from the IT team to address, which is pretty much translating which KPIs is success of IT mission. And we got very clearly that the leaders of the corporations see IT and measure IT from the KPIs lens of security improvement, performance reliability for IT for the business, savings of costs and efficiency of operations, let alone obviously to make sure that the engagement of their own customers and whatever apps and, and, and process to engage their customers are, are improved. So we look at that and that was across the board. So we look at that in the United States, we did something similar to other regions, but I just put here the United States one. So we, we look at that and say, okay, those four pillars are areas that are clearly KPIs that the IT organizations need to deliver upon. So we look at that and then we contrast that with the, what I call the multi-cloud operational matrix, which sometimes is used as operational madness, which is every customer or the majority of them has some sort of infrastructure underneath, either being their own data centers or really on the cloud. And, and by doing this, what we pretty much did is look at and there are applications that the business are delivering to their customers. And in between, there is sort of a sandwich. And the sandwich starts with the software defined X or software defined or whatever from the software defined WAN, one area network that's being implemented everywhere these days is very important. The software defined networking, which was a conversation that started almost five, six years, seven years ago. There was software defined compute 10 years ago that was called virtualization. There is software defined storage that's now we call hyperconvergence. So either or, there is more on the realm of the IT ops people, but on top of that, then you have the OSs versus containers. You virtualize, you containerize, and any of the developers on any of you as a customer would either decide to go today and develop an application which is microservices based, which tends to be stateless and running, for instance, the Kubernetes is the de facto orchestrator called native app, or they're going to choose a serverless framework. And that relates to the fact that how bigger and scalability do I want to have for my app, and at the same time, am I enabled to be myself locked in in a particular cloud framework? So some people go and marry themselves with AWS Lambda or Azure Functions. Some people use this like Kubeless or, or something that's a serverless framework on top of on-premises or non-public cloud motions. And as an IT, they provide this. I don't know, and there are multiple frameworks for Apache open source. But the whole point is if the developer goes to the Kubernetes for a cloud native, it's different paths than the serverless and the other way around. And everybody's expecting some sort of cloud services. So that's why I call this a madness because it's not trivial, it's not straightforward. The only things, the only three things that become normalizers of this is obviously the connectivity that force all of this together, the security, and then the automation. So that's why connected experience presumes that you come and you need to connect all of them because otherwise they, they obviously don't work together in the digital world. And from that, security and automation becomes a bridge. But there is a right-hand side of this slide, which is the people, which has to do with my second piece, which is persona-driven. As you can see, there is a blurry between charters and, and, and teams like DevOps as an initiative and SecOps as, or even that SecOps, and it's start to get to the buzzwords of the, the industry today. But these motions of teams being in silos get totally kind of a challenge when you get these multi-cloud motions in place. So if I summarize what I just said, 
from an outside in standpoint, we came to a motion that's called an inside in, 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 a VIA, a Visibility Inside and Action Framework, which I'm going to show on the next slide, where we came with the organization between insights and automation engines. We talk about mainly for this session which teams or personas we're going to talk for the traditional uh, organizations that are already far ahead in the motion of DevOps or starting that motion or actually making this work then why do we speak? And from an operation standpoint, just recognize that there is motions for ops based on ITU and I'm assuming that a lot of people that are attending here even ITU certified themselves. There's a lot of DevOps practitioners out there on many of the companies that they gotta work together and there is obviously SRE as an end goal based on the model that Google created and, and there are some people that are inserted either on IT or DevOps to try to transition operations of those organizations to that. So with that scenario as an introduction, what we realized myself and part of the team that was building that is that, okay, this is not something that you build two products and, and get ahead to talk with the customer and you negotiate a point or X of the discount and, and ask two more people to implement in a week or so. So we came for that and said, there is a need for an operations framework. This is an ops problem. And then we came with that framework, which is extremely high level by design and is not tied to Cisco because even though we'd love that every customer would consume everything for Cisco, this is not reality. It's just point blank. And even if you put any competition aside, there is partners. So we work with AWS, we work with Azure, we work with Google, we work with services now. And a lot of partners that are technology partners that belong part of the solution with areas that Cisco just don't have a solution. So we work together on that. But my point to the visibility insight and action framework is pretty much what it meant to say. So everything that we go inside Cisco and do, it must consider visibility. You may have noticed that we just acquired a company a week and a so ago, which is called Tyson Eyes, Tyson Eyes, which brings full visibility for the internet as an underlay when stuff like SD1 comes on top of it. And it has agents that go from application all the way to Raspberry Pi, if you will. So visibility is an insertion, then all the products from Cisco and all the, the areas of the business that react upon, it does now bring visibility. It can be sample visibility like classical NetFlow on a, on a campus network, all the way to time series database or real-time streaming based on Kafka and, and, and Kafka topics and stuff. And given that visibility ingestion, then it feeds what I call insights engines. So engines that are able to ingest that data, learn from that data, and change a particular behavior or recommendation based on that insight, which is typically augmented by machine learning and AI, an area that Cisco has been heavily investing in the last two, three years, including to augment all of our technologies. And that recommends or that brings recommendations and decisions that will trigger actions. And those actions is all about how it can secure and automate the full stack, which might be 100% Cisco products, 50% Cisco product, 30% Cisco product, but the whole point of this framework is there is a what. It's an operation framework that is predicated on the ingestion of real-time visibility, real-time generation of insights based on that, that augment intent to trigger actions that can be from a notification up to a enforcement of something and security for radiation up to a scaling out of automation environment of public cloud, whatever it is, that action will generate more data that will be fed to the visibility going to the engine. So as you can tell, it's a real-time data-driven feedback loop, which is the what. So that's nice. It's not predicated on Cisco only, but this is the what. So we went to the how and said, okay, how can I translate that vision on a reality that my customers can consume? So what we did, is we pretty much recognized that everything needs to be operation-centered, like I said before. So we took that lens and organized our solutions and, in fact, our development acquisitions and motions moving forward on a day zero, day one, day two life cycle, which on a traditional corporation may take longer on a DevOps, maybe part of a DevOps pipeline, either or, what we did, we organized our whole portfolio on what we call insights engines and automation engines. 
So insights are the ones that I said, ingest data, learn from that data, and then be able to augment an intent that will feed an automation engine because the automation engine receives an automation from someone else, do what it needs to be done and contextualize back to the insights. Let me give an example to make it more realistic. So an automation engine is, for instance, Cisco ACI. Someone you need to define how the grouping of the network works. And by the time you define and configure that, ACI is going to render this on the network, and then it's going to be totally automated. You don't need to be concerned on any of that. All the consistency checks will be done. You just need to define what the intent for that network would be. The point is, if you automate today an ACI and it renders this in the switches and you don't change that intent, next year the network is running the same way. It was automated one year ago. The same applies, for instance, with Ansible. If I have an Ansible network playbook and I render that and Ansible does touch the, the infrastructure like servers and just boot up a Windows image, until we change that, it's, it's automated. An insight engine is different. You ingest some data on it. So let's say, let's take up Dynamics as an example. You have an application running, you have an application performance management agent for App Dynamics embedded on that code, which is instrumented that code. Every time that application runs, that metadata is being sent to the central application, the App Dynamics controller. The App Dynamics controller analyzes that data and generates, and is augmented by AI, generates a, an action which is, okay, this application performance is okay, or there is an issue, I'm generating alarm all the way to go eventually to the code and say that line of code is not properly done, you better change that. So another example is Cisco titration, when you have the very same thing, you learn what's going on on an application, you feed an environment, it learns from there, and then it can recommend to all the dependence mapping all the way to provide an enforcement or micro-segmentation policy and stuff like this. So my point is we did our own homework inside Cisco to organize ourselves upon that portfolio, yeah, on a full portfolio upon those two concepts. So it's just an example of the Cisco portfolio for the people that are used to that. As you can see on the left-hand side, I have open source and third party on both insights and automation engines. As I mentioned as an example, Ansible is, is an automation engine. And so is Terraform, for instance. If you use Terraform for multi-cloud automation with infrastructure as code, is, a, is an automation engine. But we have our own with Vitkela for SD1, InterSide, ACI, and, and Cloud Center, and, and a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show on the demo soon. On the insights, I use two examples on app dynamics and titration. We have the workload optimizer for everything that's right sizing for multi cloud. We have Umbrella, a Stealth Watch, which is part of the cloud native security and SASE. And, and anyway, so as you can see, the idea is for us to simplify. And I'm going to go now on the second part of this presentation to show a little bit more details on what we did and how we come in with that. And for that, I'm just going to consume a subset of those balls and, and just use an example with two of them. So let me give you a different view on what we could do, and that's the first example that I want to portray to you. So we want to offer a multi-cloud stack or a multi-cloud capability for our customers, either if they're migrating to cloud or they're just trying to run some applications on the cloud while they run something in their data centers, or they want already having a services running on the cloud and they want to see how secure it is or how performatic it is or how much costly it is and stuff like that. So we look at that. I need to have a multi-domain view for, for that multi-cloud offer. So what, what I did was let's take the insight and automation and put the motions on the pillars that we thought about. So there is an operational life cycle which is predicated on the left. So everything has a design, deploy, and manage and operate motion. And as you change that, this is dynamic. There are people on top. And those teams usually are in charge of those particular assets, like an app dynamics application performance management tool is typically a tool owned by the app owner team or the app ops team and is meant and helpful for the day two operations, if you will. 
while let's say Cisco ACI or Cisco InterSight is more of a day one deploy and implement kind of systems and networking respectively, which is owned usually by the IT ops being the compute storage teams and the network teams. So you see the picture here. So what I'm trying to depict here is getting this uh, position on that framework. And when I look at that, it's interesting, but it's complex because you see two points. There's a lot of offers, and if you remove Cisco and put other components, even competitors of ours, you're going to see that it doesn't change the picture. It's still complex. You still have a lot of people to, to go together on that. And then what it did is how can we simplify that to get a motion that allows the teams that already exist to operate more efficient and allow them to get on a multi-cloud where they're caring about the application that runs on top anyway. So before I go there, I just included four slides here for your information. I'm talking about those offers from Cisco like InterSight and App Dynamics and and it's I don't want to be naive to presume that everybody knows what it is for now. So what I have is a couple more than a couple of slides that is for your information. So App Dynamics is pretty much an application performance management tool. So you instrument the code at the time of the code build and application build and then it sends information offline on the metadata for the App Dynamics controller that allows you to manage in real time performance manage for the application level. It also applies to the end user in a sense that that application can run on a mobile device with iOS and Android, and you can have that. And between the two ends, you have the infrastructure of the application flow that goes in between, which we also monitor. And there is one thing that's very interesting, which the business monitoring which I'm going to mention on the demo, which is there is a, a functionality in App Dynamics that's called Business IQ, which is, in summary, is pretty much it maps on US dollars how much money that application is actually making. So if I have an application running and that application is tied to a business, so as more users consume that application, as more business generated, you have a direct correlation between how the application is performing and how the business is performing. Why? Because if I have, let's say, a 5% performance impact on the application infrastructure because a server blew up or an instance is not being enough on the cloud or whatever it is, you have a direct correlation how much of the business impact goes. A lot of customers just love it because you do real-time correlation and show you how you do that. And another thing that it comes from our portfolio is experience journey map. This is, a, this is a, the previous one that I had was from the lens of the application as a provider mapping to the business. This is from a lens from the application from the consumer lens. So if I'm an application user and I'm running that app on, on, a, on a mobile device or on a browser, what this does, it tells you as an IT ops 100% of the visibility of what's going on on a per page of the app. If it's a browser, per page of the browser. If it's an application on mobile, everything, how many people are there, and what's happening. If nobody is getting to the next screen of that page and you expect that to do, you have the triggers that maps to your business. So you, you correlate the two business views, and we also have the fourth that we're going to mention, which is the workload optimizer. So the workload optimization manager, we now embedded this with InterSight. What it does, it creates from an IT ops point of view, a supply chain a dependency map that correlates from that business application all the way to the infrastructure components, be network compute and storage, either on premises or cloud instances, VPCs or VNets or whatever you run on multiple clouds and you create that dependency. And based on that, we do a real time analysis for right sizing. Is your performance okay? And one of the things that we did that unique in the industry is that we, we have a head ready to offer you and deploy for you as a customer is pretty much the closed loop multi-cloud operational model that we brought. So the previous slide that I had, I showed the life cycle, I showed you the personas, and I showed the product to scatter all over the place. So what we did, we pretty much took the intentionally in stands to do the following. Everything 
that relate to the app owner is going to be consumed or should be consumed by the tool that the app owner owns or it's on his chart. So, but the app persona consumes app dynamics, but he or she usually are completely oblivious and is blind to what's coming to the infrastructure. So what we did, we did a real-time bidirectional integration between app dynamics on either side in such a way that from a metrics-driven standpoint, we contextualize in real time for the app owner the infrastructure information that relates to the app that he or she is looking at. And we did the opposite. For InterSight to become the cockpit for the IT ops persona, we now contextualize on data-driven metrics that go from the app owner to show to the IT persona what's going on on the application that's going and running on a particular server. Let me give you an example. You own a hyperconverged cluster with hyperflex. There are three nodes. You know that one node is, is under load and you need to move some stuff on the other node or you need to commission another node. So you have two VMs running. One is 10% utilization, another is 90% utilization. What an IT person typically do? You try to relieve the 90%. What if I tell you that the one that is 90% runs $2 million on the business and one that's 10% runs $100 million on your business? Usually the IT people don't have that contextualization. And not only they don't have, they don't use this on the IT decisions because that information is not available. And if available, it's not real time contextualized. That's exactly what it did. And the last thing that we, we also did here is pretty much all the other products that I had is now, they are now hidden. So instead of having Kubernetes as another asset, we offer Kubernetes as a services on top of InterSight which means that the IT ops team can offer just as part of their catalog. And you can put this for consumption for the app people. So they click the only thing that they get is a dashboard from the Kubernetes dashboard. They don't know what it runs. They don't know how it runs. And it's actually not of their business. They are just getting a services from the IT organization. The same way we hide a lot of the cloud services for right sizing and all of that, which makes a private environment much better. The thing that we did here is to make this open. So just for the techies on the room, because I was told by Pete that I, that I got some people here that wants to go a little bit on the weeds, which I don't have time, and Pete made this point extremely clear to me, so I'm not gonna go in the weeds, but just for people to be pleased. So we select how we did the integrations, and just for the people that, that are more on the techie side, both HCI and InterSight and all the stuff that we have there is already running Open API v3. So it means that everything that we put in search as a, as a system automatically generates a RESTful API, which automatically is part of a Terraform provider. So that's why I have a multi cloud on my own for integrations, but I have this automatically generated on a Terraform provider, if you will. And we also have models with Ansible for the workloads that could run on top of computes like Hyperflex in UCS, if you will. So those integrations are happening and they're already shipping. So AppDynamics and, and the workload optimizer bidirectional integration has been shipping since January. They do integrate the workload optimizer as part of the InterSight, which is now shipping in, in less than three weeks. And InterSight is no longer a SaaS tool that only manages UCS compute. It is now a multi-vendor in a multi-cloud infrastructure as a services management platform. So with that said, let me go for the demo, which is gonna go quick before Pete gives me the look that I'm running out of time. I don't think it's gonna be even Pete. I believe the lady is gonna scream on me soon, Kathleen or who else it is. So let me go for the demo very quick and I'm gonna give you two perspectives of the demo and then you're gonna open up for questions. The first one is if I am a NAP team, a NAP owner, a NAP persona, a NAP group inside the organization. As a NAP person, I don't care much about PowerPoint, let's be honest. So what I care is about code. So what we did here in this demo, what we did, we built a dashboard and that dashboard is nothing more, what you see here is a screenshot of a dashboard that's nothing more than a Node.js application, which do a couple of things. We brought together the information that I have for business IQ, which is on the business side, on the US dollars. We brought together the transaction KPIs, 
and we brought together all the infrastructure KPIs. So this represents a next generation file nature, which is just a mobile app that happens to run on iOS and Android, and it presents two services. It presents insurance and it presents loans, and it mon monitors how many users we have at a given time. As you can see, even though you don't know what the, the good enough is, it's clear because of that yellow bubble that $850,000 is not enough, so I'm, I'm, I'm behind. And the reason I'm behind is because if I look at that, there is some yellow bubbles underneath that's being highlighted. So before I go into details on that, I want to just make sure that you guys get a couple things here. I said this is a Node.js application. That code is available on that GitHub link. So I have tons of customers that download that and play around with this, and instead of having balls, they put more balls and change the orders and all, whatever. So the infrastructure that we run behind the scenes here, this is, uh, as I said, the financial app that is a mobile app. The front end of that app runs on AWS. The back end of that app runs on, on the data center that happens to run Cisco ACI and hyperconversion with Cisco Hyperflex, on top of Hyperflex AP with KVM and with one with VMware. And we have the Cisco security on top and App Dynamics for performance management with the workload optimization enabled. So that environment is IT, for an IT infrastructure, very comprehensive. But for the app owner, I'm not exposing any of that. Because one, he doesn't know. Second, he doesn't need to know. Third, he most likely wouldn't care. So what we did here is pretty much made the code available. So some of them start to play and the reason why I have the yellow on the business side here is because I have a response time around six seconds. So imagine a mobile application on your cell phone that has six seconds of response time. A lot of people are leaving that app. And the reason for that so far that I already contextualized is I have an issue on the app server and an issue on, on the VMs that relates to the coach and discount services. So that's closest to the app world so they know that. They just don't know why is it the case and eventually how to solve this with the help of, infra of the infrastructure. And before I go to the IT ops persona, what we also did with that app, which the, again, the code is available, is we, we track how many users are going on that app at a given time. So on the time that I took that screenshot it was 83 users and the amount of money that were associated with the quotes that they are trying to go through the app that was, wasn't working properly was around $53,000. Just to keep this in mind, so I'm going to revisit this later. So what we start to do, we, we did the bidirectional contextualization on data-driven real-time between the app cockpit being app dynamics and intersight. But as you can see, even though I'm doing this behind the scenes, both of them are exposed by webhooks and APIs. So what I have is a dashboard. I don't, I'm not presenting the screen of Dynamics, neither am I presenting the screen of Intersight. So I had, for instance, could develop something like that that could be done for the customers if they want to or if they need to. So you can go straight to your teams, but you can have a dashboard of this for your business owners. So the point here, we address the six second first, and what's happened is the IT team recognized that there is a capability available inside the cluster of Hyperflex where it's running. And because it's a Java heap problem, we contextualize that Java heap it can be fixed by just increasing the amount of memory that is available. I'm not telling to the app owner where is it running. I'm not telling him that I, or her that I'm, in order to get to four gig, I'm gonna do a vMotion from one server node to another server node on the cluster, I'm gonna just balloon the VM or spin a new, a new one. I'm just saying, dude, this is your problem. I can solve it. If your corporation decides that the application person has the ability and authority to fix it by himself, we can expose the button and just execute. If not, then it goes the regular flow on approvals with the IT ops team. What did happen though, when we went to the application and infra KPIs, then we find out that is another critical issue here, which is related to supply demand, meaning Another reason, there are two reasons for the, the high response time. One is the database didn't have enough space in memory, so I have a Java heap problem. And the other reason is that on the front end that happens to run on AWS, the instance was too small. 
So I'm having a problem of supply demand. I'll have much more demand than the ability for that instance to provide. So what we right sizing recommend is that, well, guess what? You need to increase your instance. In order to do that, you have an additional investment of $400 a month. So I'll pause here for a second. This is the time where a lot of customers, when I present to them, they get to me, Carlos, let me understand. You told me that this $53,000 before is the amount of money that I'm not making if I don't fix anything. And you're now telling me that I can fix the memory problem because I have capability available and I can fix the front end by just doing a 400 investments a month. I said, you're absolutely right, sir. So, and the typical question that comes after is, why did I do that before? He said, because you didn't talk with Cisco ahead of front. So the third thing that usually happens is they call the ops people and usually ask them to change the approval flow on services now. So think about it. If the $400 goes in the typical approval and the typical approval flow within the corporation that everybody needs to sign take two, three days, that $50,000 will become $200 sooner after. And, and you lose more business of not doing anything rather than fixing because now you have the information real time. So this is an example that we put in the customers. And again, you can confirm that if you approve this on services. Now, if you are already a company born on the cloud or you're talking an application that belongs to your DevOps pipeline with a GitLab, Azure DevOps, or whatever you use, you may have this included as an approval process of the pipeline or part of your canary is checking. And by the time you do that, that fix is wrong, it's done. So you can do right sizing as part of the DevOps. And we have customers with us doing that. And by the time you approve this, expect it's all back to green. So that was the view from the application owner. I'm going to give you the view of the IT ops owner, which is pretty much the infrastructure now bottom up providing everything for that app running. So as I mentioned to you, InterSide, when it was born a couple of years ago, it was meant to manage Cisco UCS compute. And it does an awesome job of doing that. It's a SaaS. It initializes a SaaS-based application to manage infrastructure operations on premises on Cisco UCS and Cisco Hyperflex or Hyperconverge. InterSide today has evolved on three and include a lot of common services, which is the top of this, which allows us to go beyond our own infrastructure components like compute, rack servers, blades, and stuff like this. So we now embedded the workload optimization. Again, it's embedded. It's not like, here's my API, here's your API, have a nice day. No, no. We've got the code, we've got all the microservices for the workload optimizer. They run inside InterSide, and you have the same security remote connectivity for third-party services that needs to be brought for right-sizing using the same technology that security tunnel that we have for communicating UCS on InterSide, for instance. And then we evolve this to automate solutions that goes beyond the realm of compute with Cisco ACI for network, with Cisco VTL for, for SD1, with pure storage for, for flash, with VMware vSphere for hypervisors, which is not necessarily need to be hyperconverged, which as you can see, it, it goes beyond and obviously the cloud integration with the major clouds now just for, for right sizing. As you can see on the workload optimization, we are talking about workloads from a sense of talking, for instance, with OpenShift, with other flavors that we have there, with applications like Apache, Quantum Cat, and, and JVMs, and, and stuff like that. So let me give you then a perspective for the same application from the IT ops persona. Before, InterSight was managing infrastructure. Now, InterSight is an infrastructure as a services platform that is multi cloud and multi vendor. That's nice. A lot of people can do this out there. What we did now, we ingested the real-time data-driven contextualization from the two teams. So all those two screens that are here on the right-hand side, the workload optimization view of the world, it brings recommendations like scaling actions. So the action that we told on that code through API to building that dashboard is one of those 50 scaling actions. And that screen on the right-hand side is nothing more than a graphical representation of widget from the data that's coming from AppDynamics that tells me what's the transaction, the response time from a user base from the view of the application, not from the view of what my packets per second at the network or how many CPU that I have 
in utilization on the servers that are running this app. This is all good, but we gave all the application and the business associated with that application to the IT ops operations team so we can contextualize this together. So in doing that, another thing that we included is the Hyperflex cluster. As I mentioned before, we have now something that's called Hyperflex AP. So Hyperflex as a hyperversion, hyperconversion solution for Cisco. We have Hyperflex running on VMware as a hypervisor with Hyper-V as a hypervisor and now running 100% on open source with KVM and not an or and very metal container with Kubernetes. And pretty much what it does, it allows you to create as a services, Kubernetes clusters straight from Hyperflex. So you just hit here as a Hyperflex and on the intersides for a, a Kubernetes cluster, you create the cluster by defining the profile, and the profile pretty much you define what type of nodes do I want, how many master, how many worker nodes I have. I have a master node on, on Kubernetes. How many worker nodes? What type of them they're going to run locally, or they're going to distribute on Hyperflex Edge? Do I need GPU on them or not? If I need GPU because I'm running something like local AI on, on a remote site, or do I have a beefy kind of a CPU because I'm doing inferencing for data ingestion that may run there as well. And, and you have all of those parameters, and by the time you configure that, it becomes a template, and you automatically replicate it everywhere. And all the objects becomes part of the right sizing analysis that we do, which is done now by the, now by the workload optimizer which is embedded into InterSight, which as I said before, now becomes a multi-vendor and multi-cloud platform. So as you can see, I showed and I mentioned to you before quickly the dependency map. So there is a supply chain here. This is the very same application, the front end running on AWS. There are two hypervisors or hyperconversions, Hyperflex itself and the vCenter running on Hyperflex, a bunch of VMs running on and if I click on that business application especially, it's going to tell me what's the dependence mapping for itself. From the business app all the way down to where it runs, how much storage control is, what it is. So interesting enough that you see the same graphic here as expected because it's the same app. So I have contextualization on real time, what the resources that I run on the servers with the application piece that's running on there. And now you can see here on, the, on what I'm showing you, that I'm having a response time of 10 seconds and the user is that amount of this, even though my response time might be, my transaction is might be okay 20%, I have transaction per second default, my response time is still too high. So my user experience sucks, sorry about my French, even though I have enough compute power left. So theoretically, I would not touch that because I'm running 10% of CPU or 20%. But my response time for the user there from an application perspective is really, really bad. So what we did, we contextualized that and we right size from that lens up to a point that I said, well, there is something wrong on that VM that's affecting me. It's not only the Java piece that it's more on the application performance. There is something that is infrastructure related as well, which is what I just mentioned. So what we do, we do now the right size in a recommendation. As you can see here, the amount of information that the IT ops people that manage that environment has is far greater than the one that I presented on that Node.js application to the app persona. For them, I told it's $400 a month, which is the correlation of all of that. Here you have how, where it runs, which region on AWS, what's your subscription, what contract you have, how much you're going to have for hours. All of that recommendation that tells you, dude, you're here, you should get there. And you can review it, and by the time you apply, if you decide to apply for the right size recommendation, you can apply or you can automate the criteria for application. Then your pending actions are clear, and then your response time is now back to what is expected to be. And then, obviously, your utilization can go higher because you now have cleaned a lot of the bottleneck for the application to receive new users then your backend could be used better as expected. And then obviously the hold on the business going down as well. So that contextualization is very interesting. So with that said, I know that I made it on 50 minutes as you actually 48.5 as you asked Pete. 
And, and I'm just going to try to close this by saying that this is one of the examples that we did together. There is a lot of customers that are implementing that view, combined view. I show you the screens of the Cisco products. A lot of customers use them for all these operations. There are people that build their own dashboards and just consume the APIs. And part of that work has been done together with our head. So I had does have the skills on all of the pieces that I said together, but I will pass the ball to you, Pete, because I believe you can speak better than, for a head than I do, I guess. Well, thank you very much, Carlos. So yes, just to wrap up here at the end, um, I think uh, as we looked at your, your messaging there and we saw the, the correlation of, of application instrumentation with infrastructure, real-time uh, metrics coming together to give that you know, combined aggregated view is, is exactly what we're seeing in our customers, right? We don't want to look at uh, infrastructure separately from the applications. We're seeing our customers demand that they take all of that uh, data that they have and bring it together in a more meaningful way that drives value to the business. And at the beginning, you showed us your uh, Cisco multi-cloud operational matrix, which I think aligns very closely with the head's digital delivery platform. And uh, as part of that platform, which we have been uh, evolving over the last uh, considerable number of years now, it's a framework that helps our customers uh, consider what is necessary to, to achieve digital transformation and, and multi-cloud, helping them get out of just traditional silos of infrastructure and, and bring these things together. Uh, with automation and orchestration and pervasive security. Uh, three of those digital imperatives, uh, which align to our practices, are shown here on the screen, the top one being enterprise cloud. And that's where a lot of those traditional Cisco technologies that we position in our customers and, and help them uh, with the various components of their architecture, uh, where we have expertise in that. But again, as, as we spoke today, it's not just about having that infrastructure, it's about aligning that with the application. And that's where we have practices such as our intelligence, uh, intelligent operations team that, that Johnny represents. So, Johnny, do you want to speak to that quickly? Sure. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to hone in on that Carlos had talked about was data-driven insights. That's very much at the heart of what monitoring is and does for an organization and where a fantastic product like App Dynamics really, really shines. And so when we talk about intelligent operations, it's taking the data points, the monitoring information that we can glean from a tool like AppD, and how can we feed that into what is oftentimes a single source of truth for an organization, their ITSM tool, tool like ServiceNow. And so trying to fill that whole feedback loop with, all right, I now have the visibility and insight I need. I get actionable alerts and information. I can store it in the central place whereby I can collaborate on it and then how can you take some of those reoccurring events and automate the remediation so you have this full loop cycle and the tools that Carlos and the rest of the Cisco team are bringing to the table are truly fantastic and world-class in terms of enabling an organization to do exactly that. Moving on to modern apps, one of the interesting things that we're seeing is as organizations are choosing to refactor their applications, develop a microservices-based architecture. They're using orchestration tools like Kubernetes. In the intelligent ops space, we have this view of, okay, I've got something running, likely in production. When something alerts, what do I do to react? But we also need to talk about this whole proactive side in how do I make monitoring pervasive across my organization, and how do I ensure that instrumentation happens from the initial onset of the code being released or even checked in in the source code management. And so that's another aspect where modern applications are changing the world and couple that with an intelligent operations framework. One of the practical ways in which we can see that playing out is if a developer goes and checks code in to say their GitHub repo, let's have a webhook into a build server. And so now as that code gets compiled and deployed, Let's automate the deployment of, say, an AppDynamics agent into that container, into that virtual machine. And so now not only is it the production workloads that have visibility into what's going on, but also pre-production, test dev, QA workloads have just as much data-driven insight into what's going on. We can use a tool, also like an AppD, to provide an automated gating mechanism. So that way it's not just, okay, I see it. I can react to it quickly, even in my pre-prod environments, but let's add some automation there. 
And so now we can use that to inform, hey, this code is ready to be pushed into production, or no, let's automate the failure of that release at the same time. Again, data-driven insights, automation from end to end. Yeah, thank you, Johnny. And one of the things that I enjoy so much about working here at AHEAD is although we have these digital imperatives and different practices, just as we've been speaking about today with uh, you know, the messaging from Carlos, all of these tie together, right? We, as we say here on the screen, we're stitching these together. We're not working independently. We're taking the, the data and the metrics from these various types of instrumentation, instrumentation of the application and the infrastructure layer and, and pulling it together to bring about this transformation. So uh, we're collaborating together. We use tools that are designed to, uh, to interact with each other through APIs and through, through data streams, but we're also designing these and taking advantage of custom uh, intellectual property that AHEAD can help with writing to tie together solutions that, that leverage automation and APIs to, to bring this together and bring value to your organization. Uh, we see all some of the capabilities there in, in Cisco Intersight and way in which Cisco has done that to bring it together to give you that um, cohesive view of both the application and infrastructure together. So we did have a couple of questions come in and uh, I just wanted to throw the first one out here to, to both Carlos and to Johnny. And that is, you know, as we look at, at what we've been talking about today, are there any particular, you know, customers or, or industries or verticals that really struggle to start down this journey of getting the ball rolling with, with multi-cloud? Carlos, can I have you uh, respond to that one first? Yeah, so, so I would say that healthcare is struggling now, but that is a, is a, is a moment, and we've been working very close with them, and everything that we leverage here, plus all the data that came from healthcare as it relates to information for patients and the whole pandemic thing, plus in other areas, how you can create hospitals on, on situations that is wireless on front end and, and service provider. So the stitching together on healthcare on the last six months came from almost nothing to state of the art. So it's amazing what the art of the possible is. But besides healthcare, what's the one that was kind of behind before that, that whole event to your question, which verticals are struggling the most? There is ones, there are ones that, the ones that struggle the most and are moving the fastest now are the ones that were in negation mode and are being disrupted. So for instance, it's industrials. All of them are adopting automation for IoT because in, their process for manufacturing needs to be optimized because if they don't do, they are competitive due to that. So financial is the same thing. There is a lot of a lot of financial institutions that are just web-based now that provide some services that are easy to walk to a branch to do something like that. So I believe that is, if you tell me which ones are struggling the most, I would say that the ones that are still in the denial somehow are the ones that struggle, the ones that have been facing competition, competition is moving. My point to you is everybody is pretty much addressing this. Even governments now, because of that, is moving as well. So I don't. I, I believe the phase of the now is coming to an end, and, and this is moving across the board. That's what we feel at Cisco. That's what we talk with our customers. I have projects going on. I don't know about ahead. What 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 do you guys see? Yeah, Johnny, as well, you work with our customers, so, what are you seeing? Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, so I'll second your comments around around healthcare. Um, however, I'm going to take a slightly different twist on that and maybe take a step back and, and look more broadly at highly regulated industries. And I, I'm seeing some really positive movement, movement that although one might think that highly regulated industries might be some of the last to adopt uh, multi-cloud type strategies, we're actually seeing some really great movement in the financial sector, fintech companies. Um, We've even seen a, a number of successes recently with some highly regulated utilities, public utilities out there doing some really cool, innovative, interesting things. And they're transforming themselves, transforming their operations, retooling themselves uh, to deploy modern ap uh, applications and really adopt um, intelligent operations. Yeah, absolutely. I certainly second that one when we, we look at it from the from the cloud infrastructure perspective. Obviously, there's been a, a very heightened interest in immutable infrastructure uh, in some of those regulated industries because of the fact then that, you know, the risk of things like configuration drift, uh, the security risk that that poses to the organization, the challenge of compliance 
is addressed as long as we get the operational maturity around moving away from traditional infrastructure to, to infrastructure as code and immutability. Um, one last question that I had that, come in, that came in here, and that is, um, can you give us an example, Carlos, of a, of a recent success story uh, where the, the visibility, insight, and action framework that you mentioned has, has really helped the customer achieve business value, whether that's pre-COVID or during COVID? So the, I, I have one that, let's put COVID aside for a second. I have one that is before that, that we, we pretty much what I said here, we get the customer using all of this. This is one of the top five banks in the United States, so it's not a small customer. And he has the whole nine yards. He has app dynamics at scale. He has all the, the workload optimization, the infrastructure running with our compute capacity and running with VMware and hypervisor and others and Kubernetes and also public clouds. And I'm talking about over 50,000 VMs, just to give you an idea. It's not in a small environment. And we automate this and we correlate from the business exactly what I mentioned to you. So it's running in production for almost nine months now. So yes, we deliver the baby and the customer is happy. And, and it, the, the, the thing that starts to, to become more interesting, just to, to give you an example, the things that we are presenting here and that we are showing you as demos, when the customers implement this in production, it becomes stable stakes on a sense that now the bank developer team for the new digital apps count on those informations and the correlation as part of their business, which made the IT teams much more relevant because they mm -hmm. now can provide the cohesive recommendation that the business can rely upon and make decisions like, should I go after that market? Am I, am I, scalable enough to that and, and stuff like this. So that that is interesting. I, I keep an open conversation with, with this customer just to make sure that we, we, we are, you know, everything is going okay, but at the same time to learn how it goes. And another one was just a, a conversation that I have a CIO, I have with a CIO of an auto manufacturer company in Germany, and he's He's feeling the pressure of the Teslas of the world. So he spun up a, a, a whole DevOps team that is associated with the self-driving car initiatives and some of the motions. And it's interesting on how those teams operate together. So we put an infrastructure with all those properties and, and it benefits them because the guy that's developing batteries is now the same guy that are developing the consumption model, which is now the same team that are developing and the new type of, of self-driving cars test drives, which as you can imagine, a test drive on this is an interesting motion. So when, when you get this correlation in real time, the, the customer is really happy and it's helping their business. So the IT team, so the CIO talks to me, I want more. I say, oh, hey, let's talk for that. But, those are the two that came to mind, Pete, on, on if you just shot me you know, out of the boot, out of my mind. No, I appreciate that, Carlos, and it's actually a good transition to uh, an advertisement for our next uh, Connect Ahead session where you know, exactly what you said there is, is developers start to take the capabilities that we talked about today as table stakes, and it impacts the way in which they're developing solutions uh, with some of these KPIs being you know, there for their consumption to, to aid their uh, innovation. Uh, our next session in two weeks' time on uh, Friday the 10th of July will be around application modernization, so look out for uh, further information to come from ahead on that. And uh, that wraps up, wraps up our session today. So, Carlos, thank you so much for joining us. Johnny, thank you for, for being on here with us, and uh, we uh, look forward to you joining us in, uh, in two weeks' time. So thank you, and have a good weekend.